morning, everyone. I have been asked to give you a glimpse into the future of tomorrow. So we are going to spend approximately about an hour on a ride. I'm going to talk mainly about technology and those things that are going to impact your life. But we are not going to talk about technology that you have already seen or experienced or something that's already in real estate. So there's no sales pitches here. You had some of those yesterday. You're working with some great companies like Skyslope. Tyler was here. We're not going to talk about anything current. So we're not talking about Zillow or Tulio or Placer or Webmaster or real estate. None of those stuff. We're going to try and look at technology outside of our industry and try and see is there anything outside our industry that we think could be applicable to our industry and how could we possibly maybe in the future use it. Now I'm not going to go too far start 2001 Space Odyssey, so we're not going to go crazy, but we're going to look at pretty cool stuff. And because sometimes this stuff is different, I thought I would put it for you in a kind of a, a Letterman top 10. So we're going to do a 10 from 10 to 1 countdown. And in every one of those categories, those boxes, I've got you at least one, sometimes two examples to look at video. So if I found something and it's augmented reality or artificial intelligence, I went to go and find an example of somebody doing that who's not in real estate. Maybe not United Airlines, but some other kind of hospitality, maybe medical, maybe political, somewhere else where you could say, oh, that's what it looks like. What I want you to do is clean your head now because you're going to go to the movies. You don't have to take notes, right? <laughs> Think about what technology could do to our space. Technology has already overrun everything we think. The Wi-Fi, the broadband, the YouTubes, the connectivity, the mobile, the new, I mean the video games. It is basically everywhere. It hasn't really completely taken over our industry. Now we don't say, we're not recommending, we're not trying to scare you. I do not think technology can take over a realtor's work. I do not think you are going to be disintermediated. I do not think you're out of a job. I do, however, think that you will have to continuously adapt the way in which you serve your customers. Now, that adaptation is uncertain. We've seen some of it, but we haven't seen all of it, and we don't know what it is, and nobody knows what it is. You do not have to be first, but you can't afford to be last. What this group needs to do is make sure that you remain progressively open-minded to look at new technology every year and say, what is the one thing I would like to do that would make me better, faster, quicker, cheaper, whatever you'd like to do, and then do that one thing well. You do not have to be as good as Microsoft or Apple. You just have to beat the other realtors. And realtors are traditionally lazy, right? <laughs> they are slow. They don't adapt. They are stubborn. As an industry, we do not move fast. That's to your advantage, because you just have to move fast in that masses that doesn't really move a lot. We are an industry that adopts very slowly. Why? Not because we're dumb. We're not dumb. Because we are independent contractors. We are entrepreneurs. We are franchises. We think for ourselves. We are a bunch of Gregorious self-going, outgoing personality, a personality, high Ds. Right? We do it my way. And because of that, we tend to all do it our way. That's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. Just understand that. So the whole entire industry is like that. You have to beat the Keller Williamses and the Remax and the Coal Bankers and the Exit Realties. Those are the companies you have to beat. So I'm going to start showing. We're going to start. Let's move to our slide deck up there, please. So we're going to start looking. And what I want you to do is simply just answer one question for yourself after you've now watched the videos for about an hour. How could potentially technology in general, the technology which you know, which you do not know, which you're going to see, how could that possibly enable you, empower you to service your customer, your consumer in the future better? We know that they have access to more information. We know that half the stuff they get on the web is probably not true. We know that they're struggling. We know that there's overload. But they do have access to information. You are either going to be part of that equation by filtering the experience out, by making it better, by enhancing it, or you're going to be a byproduct in time. You might not be called a realtor many years. You might be called a home lifestyle advisor. <laughs> Does it really matter? They still need you because what you do is not just simply one task. If real estate was a simple task like selling a book on Amazon, you would have a SKU number and I would have automated you 20 years ago. We all know that real estate is a very complex, very messy, very time -yous, very once every five, six, seven years. We have enough things that make our transaction tricky. So you are my guide. 
So let's look. I'm going to start with relatively easy ones, and then we're going to count down to slightly more scary ones as we go down. So the first one is, these are categories, remember? I'm not promoting companies. Not one company which I'm going to put up here today knows that I'm putting up their video. So this is not a sales pitch for them. We took a category. We said, what would be a nice example to show you this morning? So wearables, wristwatches, anything that you no longer just carry in your pocket, but you can pin it to yourself. You can put it around your hand, or around your neck, some kind of jewelry. At the moment, we consider wearables mainly to be smart, smart watches. Big category, been around for a long time. Most of you would consider this to be those old clunky Sanyo big watches. But it's not that anymore. You start seeing watches which look like this. They look a little bit more like a Psycho, Omega, Swiss watch kind of stuff. They look pretty sexy. But they are fully integrated with Outlook, Facebook, social media, your office, your calendar, your Fitbit, integrated. And they actually show time, which is their original purpose. So increasingly, when technology comes out in a category, remember the first time you saw a cell phone, when was that? Like late 70s, right? It was like this big, remember? <laughs> you bolted it to the middle of the car with two big bolts. It cost $4,200. Now, that's, how does it look like today? Yeah, small. So everything starts usually clunky, big, expensive. It doesn't always work perfectly. And then we criticize it. But it takes maybe three, four, five, six, seven years before they get it right, get it down to critical mass, get mass volume, get production. Big companies come in, they fund it, and suddenly it goes mainstream. These things are probably pretty close to mainstream now, meaning that within a matter of a couple of years, you're probably going to have everybody wear one. How long does it take to get something to go mainstream? Sometimes about 10 to 20 years. Why? Because there's 7 billion people on the planet. You physically have to sell a few thousand of every product every single day for 10 years to get to the number of people. So if you say, well, I'm not going to buy that, that's fine, just wait in line because I have 10 years of clients already ahead of you. That's how most technology companies think. They don't need your business. There's enough other people standing in line. I mean, how many businesses like an Apple can have people actually go stand in a line in a shop days before the time to get a new version of a product which you already have, which is already working, you just want the new one because it's version what? Five, six, seven, eight, one. You are all addicted to technology, absolutely. I mean, how many of you do not have a phone? How many of you do not have your phone here with you? How many has not played with their phone since they woke up this morning? How many is there a high probability was the last thing you touched when you went to bed last night? Right? <laughs> Kidding aside, it, I mean, it, it has changed the way we do everything. Right? It will change how we do real estate. To what extent, we don't quite know yet. But it, it will shape us. So phones and the way they change. What's interesting about these phones is that they now have their own URL, their own connectivity. They no longer have to tether to a cell phone or to a laptop or to an iPad. It's not a Bluetooth connection. They're now getting to a stage where they are completely freestanding. So you don't need another device. And of course, they're voice enabled like Siri. Now, you don't have a keyboard. You don't need one. They've written a complete new operating system, which means they function on their own. They're starting to become mini computers, which you carry around your wrist. Now people are saying, well, I don't want to wear a watch. I might want a, I don't know, Realty One badge. You guys all have a one on your chest here. Maybe that should become my new device. A wearable can mean anything in the future, not just one thing. All right, next category. Something that flies. You know, is it a bullet, is it a plane? No, it's Superman, that kind of story. Now it's a drone. It is only approximately now two years ago that a realtor was given a license for the first time to fly a drone legally for business for real estate sales. So it's not that long ago. Now these have become so commercial, you can buy them at almost any store at any price, whether they're little small ones to big ones. So it's not the drone, but it's the fact that the drones are getting smarter and smarter. Look at this one for argument's sake. Revolutionary new features that simplify the One of the recent ones from Phantom. Tap fly. It has intelligence. With tap fly. You Just give it a GPS location. Screen where you want to go. Just show it a picture on a map. Right Just tell it to go home. Right now. Phantom 4 is Flies around mountains, buildings, scenery, stops for cars, elevation, stops for birds, goes around. When in tap fly mode, it will so it is no longer just a dumb little machine which you buy for 20 bucks at Best Buy. It has now become a mini computer, which we were talking about on your wrist in a second. Now I'm giving my wrist thing wings. <laughs> and it can go anywhere. It can hover, it can stand, it can go somewhere else. I've seen some of these which have a range of two, three hundred miles. 
So we are struggling with now, and if you're in a room like this already, half of you have now put your phones on this morning to record something. So not only am I being recorded from time to time, now things will be flying around recording things. So we've now had already court cases. What happens if a drone flies over a property and is taking, I don't know, a photo of something and you're in your house undressing yourself and it takes a photo of you accidentally undressing yourself? Invasion of privacy. What happens if it flies too high and hits a plane? What happens if it flies too low and hits a car? What happens if it flies into a bird and falls down on a car that then hits a passenger? So it's not the drone. The drones are here. It's how do we deal with it? We as humans don't like change. We're uncomfortable to it. So 20 years ago when I said to you, please, would you give me your credit information, your credit card, your social security number, all your personal information, I want to take it, I'm going to put it into Ethernet. I'm going to go to a place which is named after a river in South America called Amazon.com. <laughs> I'm going to take all your personal information in there, and miraculously, I don't know how, but two days later there'll be a package on your front door with everything you ordered. You would have said, take a hike. 20 years ago, 20 years ago. 20 years later, what? Amazon, biggest retail store in the world. 20 years ago, I would have said to you, would you like to talk to the pretty lady inside the in Bank of America, or would you like to go outside? There's two bricks. There's a little hole between the two bricks. You take a piece of plastic, you slide it between the two holes, and it'll spew out money for you. And you said, no, no, I like the pretty lady on the inside, right? Today, we call that an ATM. Today, more transactions happen through an ATM than through the lady behind the counter. It took 20 years. To, I'm just using you two as an example. It took 20 years of you to change you and the whole population which you represent. So these technologies are around. The question is not the technology. The question is, can you handle pizza delivery by a drone? Right? Can you? Initially, it's cool, and later on, the coolness goes away. Now, is it cheap enough? Is it practical? Will my pizza be cold? Will it be stolen? Can it be lo left at my front door? How do I get security? So we evolve. Now, people are already way past just dropping off pizza. So somebody said, if I have to fly somewhere, I'm not flying United. <laughs> right? I don't like TSA. So why don't I fly my drone? So they built the E-Hang 185, I think. It's the first passenger drone that can actually fly a human in a drone. I saw, we all saw that one coming, right? No, right? So here it is. Just Already rolled out. Drone. The E-Hang 184 is a fully electric aircraft. That might sound a little strange at first, but electric aircraft are indeed on the way. In fact, Airbus just created the first electric plane to cross the English Channel in a late 2015 experiment. The E-Hung 184 is 5.5 meters long, takes two hours to charge, and can fly for 23 minutes at about 500 meters off the ground. It has a maximum altitude of 3.5 kilometers and a top speed of 101 kilometers per hour. And a fun fact, the flight destination interface is actually a Microsoft Surface tablet. Ah, the plane's controlled by my tablet. And you feel how comfortable? So now you're saying a real estate transaction cannot happen without a realtor. I'm being flown by my tablet. <laughs> They've way past getting rid of a realtor, right? We're not talking about getting rid of pilots. So no, of course, there still is a pilot somewhere controlling the tablet, and you're still controlling the tablet. So the human doesn't go away. But the human's role and knowledge and functionality and skill set has to adapt. Now, forget the specs which they said it can only fly so far, so high. That's just because it's the prototype. It's the initial one. At some stage, it's going to be able to fly as far as you would like it. At some stage, the price will come down to where people can afford it. So if you suddenly could buy a flying drone that could take you around to go show open houses, and the drone was only a grand, would you consider buying? Yeah, yeah just to play with it, right? I want to see how it works. So it's easy enough to sell the stuff once you, once you test it, get all the approvals, get all the, everything, test the market, and then put it at a price which is affordable. Now, they'll put it as high as possible that you'll pay for it. They're not going to bring it too, too low because they don't want to make no money. They want to make as much money as they can. So they'll have it high and then come down with specials and lower and lower and lower until they see, ah, we've hit that magical sweet spot where there's thousands of people buying it. They have found that sweet spot with phones with iPads, with computers, with big TV screens. I mean, it's not hard to find that spot. That spot's already been determined. Interesting. So we are now going to have wearables that can fly. All right. Now, at the moment, I have a clicker in my hand, which is nothing special, just a standard clicker, which they gave me. I hit a forward button. Guess what? Sends a message, ping, all the way to my laptop, pushes the slide button, and my keynote presentation goes one slide forward. Why do I need this? Only because we were raised that way to say, this is a clicker. This is like a mouse. It's like a keyboard. You can't operate a computer without a keyboard. Says who? <laughs> Siri is without a keyboard. So they've now come up and said, how about if we had motion fusion? 
pretty cool. What's motion fusion? Motion fusion is where you either at this point in time strap something to your arm, which is the most common way at the moment, it's like a rubber band around your arm, and it actually looks at the muscles in your arm. When I click this thing, I have a motion which goes click down. That action can be measured here. If you turn a radio on louder and you take the dial, you turn the dial. That motion can be felt by the arm. So now they have a graphic user interface, which is a rubber band around your arm, which reads your commands for you. So you no longer need a clicker for anything. Not for your mouse, not for your VCR, not for your TV, not for anything. Here's an example of a guy. Watch first, the, the hysteria is off. Then he clicks on. He doesn't like the sound, so he turns it louder. Then he plays a video game. Then he controls a drone and more. Nope. Well, come on. Guy plays video games, shoots with his finger. No, he wants a rifle. Takes it out. Got the big guns now. Controlling a drone with hand movements. Now watch that guy. No clicker, just his hand movements and he can do what I'm doing with the clicker at the moment. That's pretty cool. This guy's watching video, how to make a chicken. He rewinds the video by just flicking his wrist. So suddenly, all the devices in your house actually now not only become voice activated, they become motion activated. That's pretty cool if it understands the motion correctly. <laughs> what if I had a other motion in mind, <laughs> right? And it does something wrong. But again, we've solved most of that over years and time. So motion fusion says, that's going to be interesting. So now we have got, let's see, we've got smart stuff which we can wear. They can fly. I could fly in them. I can control them with a tablet. And I can do like wave my hand. And certain things can happen, right? So that's already a little further than today. We're all used to printing business cards. We think we're pretty cool when we can make something else. They created 3D printing probably a decade and a half ago, but it was unknown, it was un not commercialized. It was sort of in the, in the secret dark world. Maybe about four or five years ago, it started coming out mainstream. It's already a multi-billion dollar business. There are already two stores that I'm aware of that are exclusively 3D printing shops only. They don't sell normal stuff and 3D printers, they sell only 3D printers. There's somebody now trying to create a 3D printing franchise if you want to go into another business. <laughs> so lots of new business. So they had a competition a year ago to say, what would be the coolest thing you could print with a 3D printer? So people came up with an idea. The winner was somebody who said they could print food, in this case, pizza, for astronauts when they go on space missions. Hmm. Director won a $125,000 grant last year to build a prototype 3D printer designed to print food for astronauts on their long journeys. His goal was to print a pizza with his open source RepRap and Dell printer, and by George, he did it! Company XYZ Printing has also made a printer that can print pizza and chocolate and other goodies, but doesn't seem to be released yet, so hopefully in 2016 we can all start 3D printing food and not just the astronauts. If pizza's not your thing, then there's a Kickstarter campaign for 3D printing pancakes. So now you can take your kids' drawings and make them eat it in Still fun. So I said, let's see if I can find out three scary things that you could print. So there's already been one case where somebody's printed a gun, All right? So the plastic was not up to par. It wasn't put together together. The machine which he used was not that accurate. So he printed the gun and then he used it in a heist. He pulled the trigger and the gun exploded in his hand. He got hurt, now he's suing somebody. Yeah, so who would he sue now? The plastic guy, the 3D printer guy, the guy that sold him the plans, the city council that approved it, the guy that made the 3D gun, he himself, also the bank where he tried to break into to go break, I mean, who do you sue now in this case? Now we had the same problem before when something happens with new technology because we're going into uncharted, uncharted world. The next thing that we found, which is also slightly scary still is, we see people are now printing or trying to print 3D prescription medicine. 
So you get an order from your doctor, he sends you an electronic code or a barcode or some kind of a pin code, you go to machine, you put it in, you can print it once or twice. Sounds great, what happens if you can circumvent that code? <laughs> what happens if you can get the code just to go on and on and on and on? So, so you might in the very foreseeable future be able to print your own medicine at home anywhere, anytime. And then we have now two examples of companies that have now printed a house with a 3D printer. We have one here in, California, in America, I think it's in Minnesota. He actually printed a mini castle for his kid in the backyard. And then we have one person in China at the moment who's printed 10 houses, everything excluding the roof, in 24 hours. There's no way anybody in our country can build 10 houses in one day. So it's still a prototype. The first attempt that was also just completed last year was to build a three-story multi-level apartment also been completed. Now, still early stages, still testing, but if we can start building with one 3D printer 10 houses a day, and you have 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 of those machines, we could solve the world housing problem very quickly. Now, those houses at the moment is probably not the house you want to live in. I get that. But there are billions of people, whether it's South America, Africa, Asia, that have nothing that might solve a huge need. So housing, medicine, ammunition, guns, so we are going to go into new territory. 3D printing, big, big, big business. So now we have flying things, talking things, printing things, things that you can make, which means that all the things that we can do are simply just getting smarter. You already have something smart because you call your phone a smartphone. Now how smart is this phone? It isn't really that smart. All we really did is we took multiple functionalities and we cobbled it together into one device. It now has a camera, but that doesn't make it smart per se. But we consider that a smartphone. In most cases, smart means that there's some kind of artificial intelligence in it where it has some kind of algorithm that will take some presumptive answer and question and anticipate it and do something before you think it's necessary to do. So let's look at some of the devices. There are many out there. I found one the other day, a smart bed. I'm not sure why you would want your bed to be smart. It's a sensitive subject matter, right? But Basically, you can buy now some kind of blankets that you put over your bed. It will actually measure the temperature that you sleep on your bed, find out what you like and what your spouse like. It will realize when you're coming home, it will look at your calendar when you open the front door. It will adjust the bed temperature. While you're in the bed, it will take your heart rate and other medical stuff. It will actually cross-reference it with WebMD and actually give you a medical report every morning when you wake up to tell you what your heart rate was, etc., etc. If there's something wrong, it will do some recommendations and give you an email when you wake up to tell you what you should be drinking or doing. And when you wake up, it can actually integrate with your Fitbit and it can integrate with household appliances like a coffee machine and put the coffee on. Well, that's more than just a smart bed, right? If you did a sale today and it feels that you're in a good mood, it'll adjust the temperature in the bed to accommodate a good evening. Okay. Next one, which we've now just seen, which has just come out in England, is a smart fridge. Now, not the early versions which are already available in the US, which is a Samsung version. That is a, a fridge which has a computer in it. This fridge has gone a little bit further. It will scan all the barcodes of all the materials inside your fridge. It will look at the expiry date of all the stuff in your fridge. It will realize which items will be old in two or three days' time. It will go on Amazon Prime, the home grocer, and order that item for you so that you have a new item before the item which is going to get old is old because it's not old yet. It will do it on a one-click service or it will give you the option to do so by a text if you would like to get a text. It has loose tiles in the fridge, which means that every tile is movable. When items are bad or old, they will move them to the back or to the front of the fridge. And the fridge, of course, is completely self-cleaning. All righty, now we're, now we're talking smart, right? Now, I mean, that's not just a fridge with a computer in it. So already launched, we've already seen the prototype. It's, again, not mainstream. Most of this stuff was, gets created, gets tested. They take two, three years to make it work, find out the prices, find the right parties, and then they will roll it out. We'll probably have it here, my guess is 2018, the researchers 2019. The are developing a refrigerator that orders food and suggests recipes based on the food you've got stored in the refrigerator. Nice. This smart fridge is able to scan the contents inside, make shopping lists, and informs us when a veggie is rotting. The high-tech fridge will be equipped with nano-articulated technology that allows it to move food products around the interior via an array of micro tiles. Being built in collaborations between the online supermarket Okado and scientists at University of Central Lancashire, hope is that this future technology will cut down on food waste significantly. 
Already being called the fridge of the future, it is also capable of self-cleaning. You see, the difference between now and three decades ago is we were trying to design technology for the first time as we understand technology today to be. So it was the personal computer. We were trying to find out how we would connect people. We had wide area networks and then local area networks. And then we came up with the ARPNET, which then became the internet. We were so excited when we could send a message across. Today, technology is a given. Clients have bought into it. The market is there. The global network is there. Broadband is there. Mobility is there. Wi-Fi is there. So at the moment, the new products which are being designed are being designed on top of the existing platforms. So these aren't people redesigning technology. They're saying, where is something in the real world that you use every day that has not yet been automated? We've automated the web part. Now let's automate the real life part. Ah, fridge, bed, cleaning machine, car, house, chimney, Santa Claus. I mean, we look at everything that exists in your life. And somebody says, there's an opportunity. Nobody's automated that part yet. I'm going to become a billionaire. So happens very, very quickly. If we are going to have lots of smart devices everywhere, at some stage, these devices are going to want power. Because now we can Wi-Fi and we can, I don't know, LGT everything, but damn, we don't have enough juice. So we have extra juices which we carry around with us, right? Or we go sit against the wall, not because they like the wall, because there's an outlet against the wall. We plug it in there. Or last night, what was the last thing you did before you went to bed? You took your special device. <laughs> You went to the plug and you plugged it in, so it would get juiced last night, right? Now they're saying, what if we could give wireless power to you anywhere, anytime? What if we could take that same internet signal, which you have already accepted, because the signal at the moment is going, bing, 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 boom. And it comes here to Kuba's mom, right here. She already accepts that signal because she already has the device. What if I could send some power on that same signal, which she already accepts? So that's what they've now discovered, created, Patented, two companies have the patent, they're in New York, they're going to roll the company out later this year or next year. Here's one example. The most basic function of CODA is to transmit convenient power to a receiver in a device. Using a phone being charged by CODA via a wireless sleeve as an example, the CODA system works as follows. The receiver device sends out a low-power omnidirectional beacon. The transmitter captures the beacon that is bounced all over the room and decodes the location of the receiver by computing the phase of all the incident waves. The transmitter then computes the complex conjugate of all the incident waves and then transmits a higher power reflection of the beacon back to the receiver. All the individual power waves bounce off the same surfaces in the room and converge upon the receiver at a power level of up to one watt. This process is repeated 100 times per second to track moving receivers. CODA transmits power to mobile, wearable, and IoT devices with a user experience equivalent to mobile. So the power which is being sent to you at one kilobyte per 100 times per second is so small that that same fear which you had when you got the cell phone for the first time 20 years ago, remember? You were going to get breast cancer. Remember the fear which we had? You couldn't hold it to your ear. You shouldn't put it in your bra. Where am I going to put it? Because I don't know it's going to be a dangerous thing. We've all either overlived that. We've all survived that. Either we don't care the phone's more important, or we found out that the scare was bigger than the actual problem was, right? Or they solved it. Somewhere in between, I don't know, but it went away. Because we all have phones today. Or any of you not using your phone because of your fear of cancer? No. We, we have whatever. <laughs> if I have to die 12 months earlier, I'll, I'm using my phone, <laughs> right? They're saying this is probably just going to be the same. So you will come to a convention like this, and while you have Wi-Fi in the room, your phone and your devices will all be charged. Very cool, which means I don't have a Tesla. But if I had a Tesla, I could drive into my garage now and could just be charged. I don't have to plug it in anymore. I could just walk into a plane and all my devices would just charge. But it creates a whole set of new problems. This hotel wasn't originally geared for 300, what is it, 852 people to go on the internet at the same time. Now you're going to have 852 people also want to get power at the same time. Right? Just think of all the stuff happening in the air. I'm not talking about the scariness of it. I'm just talking about the volume and the management, which means we need new, what? I don't know, diffusers, descenders, distributors, generators. I mean, we're going to need more stuff to send more stuff to more places because more people want more people want more stuff. Great. Somebody's going to get stinking rich. The question is, how do we work as realtors? Does it help us as a realtor? Sure. Wireless energy would be absolutely awesome. All right, next one. What are we next one? We should be, 
All right, so we're at the halfway mark. So let's look at the first five which we looked at just to give you a range because we're now getting to the good stuff. This was the normal stuff. So wearables, you're going to wear technology in the strangest of places, probably the wrist, but then also other places. You're going to have certain devices, which we currently refer to as drones, that will be able to fly firstly within a certain distance, then out of a distance, then within control, then controlled with other measures. Motion fusion, you're going to be able to control devices through voice, as you already can with a Siri, but also probably through some kind of gesture control or hand control. Might initially be muscles, it looks like, but they're talking about putting a ring on your finger or something like that as well. 3D printing, we are going to have a new series of machines that can print us theoretically, according to current thinking, just about anything you want. That's going to go fairly slow because we have to now find regulations. How do we deal with the medicines, the guns, and all the other tricky stuff? And then halfway mark, smart devices, that word smart, which we have fallen in love with, is going to be affixed to just about everything. Smart bed, smart wristwatch, Fitbit, bed, fridge, stove, front door, lights, everything is going to become smart. So we are ultimately going to have smart homes, which we already have in some cases, but we haven't defined really what a smart home is yet, right? Is a smart home really just a guy that can open his garage door from outside, or is it more than that? All right, so let's go to number five. So we're going to the top five now. Nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a word to describe something that is freaking small. I am, let's say, I'm one inch shorter than six foot. So I am about two billion nanometers. Billion has nine zeros, million has six zeros. So that's two billion. A hair from anybody's head, right? About 10,000 nanometers, 10,000. If you split a human hair seven ways to Sunday, you can no longer see it with the naked eye. Uh, a seventh of a hair, they say, is approximately the size that even a person with good eyesight can no longer see without any kind of equipment or help. So 10,000, they are now creating technology and transistors around about the one, two, three, four nanometers. So they are saying that if they were to create a computer which is, or a chip, or a function, at around about one, two, three, four, they can put 200, 300, 400 of those nanometer technologies on this table here, and it will be smaller than a human hair, which means you will not be able to see it. So firstly, we have wearables which can fly, which are smart, which now have become invisible. Mm -hmm. So we can now put them anywhere and you won't know they're there. What can I do with nanotechnology? Well, lots of things. Here's one example. I think, do we skip one? Why does that feel? Yeah, it feels like it skipped one. Go back machine. So let's show, let me show you that one. There we are. Here's an example of an item which they coat with nanotechnology. The one on the one side has a thin skin of nanotechnology to protect it. The other one does not. So when you put the electricity into the water, the power into the water, the one dies immediately because we know what happens. The other one has got this thin coated skin on top which prevents it from damaging. Then they took simple tissue. If you put any kind of liquid on tissue, what usually happens? Uh, it absorbs it and then it falls through. On the other side, this looks like a school experiment. Remember Quicksilver? Which means I could put nanotechnology now on my clothing it goes dry cleaning business, right? Doesn't have to be washed ever, because I could protect my clothes forever. I mean, I could wear the same underwear for life. Right? <laughs> now, there might be good reasons not to, but you get the point. You can protect things from getting damaged. So is, is that your skin? Is that the work gloves? Is that car? Is that grease? Is it factory? Is it normal wear? How far does it go and how far can you use it? That's just if you want to protect it. The most current application at the moment being used is that you can take those little small transistors, put them in medicine and have people swallow the medicine. So I can give you a piece of medicine that has micro nanotechnology inside, you swallow it, and it's almost like honey shrunk the kids, remember? It's like a little submarine in your blood cells, right? And it can actually go and look at stuff, take photos of your inside, through the internet posted to your Facebook page so that you and your doctor can see it. And then when it's done its task, it'll actually swim itself out you know where. <laughs> right? Self-controlling. That's already available today. It's physically just the next step. Can we use nanotechnology in real estate? Start thinking of ways. Don't ask me to give you the answers. You are the experts. You've got to think, how are we going to use some of these things in our space? You don't have to do it today or tomorrow. 
or next year, you need to just start being a progressive Realty One agent. You know, I don't want normal agents. Got to be ahead of the curve. Head of the curve is not 10 years. Head of the curve is just, just a year or two, just a little bit, right? Just ahead of the other guy. Just ahead of the other guy. You've got to think of how can we use some of this stuff. All right, so now we've got very, very small stuff, right? Stuff which you can't see. Best application I heard the other day from somebody in a brainstorming meeting was a company. Let's say you paint your walls white. So you take regular white paint, which you buy at, I don't know, say Home Depot. You take nanotechnology. Now, there is, there is technology on her screen here, right? On a normal computer. And if I switch this on or if I go to a color swab or something, I can have the screen be blue or orange, right? I can take a picture, it can be an orange screen. So therefore, I can tell technology to change color. So if I tell my nanobots to change color, and I put those nanobots, which you cannot see, into white paint, I mix it with the paint and you paint the wall, and there's nanotechnology in the wall, and I control it with my iPhone, I could say to the wall, turn pink, right? And my white wall will actually turn pink. I don't have to paint it ever again. That's pretty cool, right? So if somebody comes to me and my wife comes home at home, home time, I'm in a romantic mood, you know, red walls. When she leaves, back to man, man cave, blue walls, right? Okay, that's interesting. Now, you would say, well, they'll never sell paint. No, they'll sell you nano paint, which will be 10 times more expensive, of course, right? And then you'll have to have a special roller to put it on because your current roller. They will find ways to make money out of you and me because that's the whole point, right? They don't love you that much. This is all capitalism. We live in a free democracy, right? How can I make money from you without putting my hand into your pocket? I need you to voluntarily give me as much money as you have without me forcing you or putting my hand into your pocket. That's marketing. That's what they're after. Right, augmented reality. This is reality. It's real. This is reality. It's real. But if I create something like um, the Avatar movie or the Disney movie, those characters are created by using graphics. They're on a computer. They're animation. If I load data onto a screen and I overlay it onto an existing piece of information, I can take factual information created on a computer or pictures or images, and I can superimpose it onto something which is real. So if you saw the movie Avatar, and you saw that big, tall, blue dude, right? He was, what, seven foot, eight foot, nice skinny guy, thin guy, and he was running. You know he's not real, because you don't get thin skin blue, blue guys, right? But when he jumps on a tree, and he runs past the waterfall, right? Is the waterfall real, or was that also created? You don't know yet. Because it could have been shot in Amazon, green screen, and they put the two together, but if they created the guy, they could have also created the waterfall. That's also a possibility. So they now get to a stage where you start merging real things and non-real things. And when you start taking reality and you add something to it, you augment it. You blend it. You enhance it. You change it. So we are now on the cusp of a generation where you can no longer believe anything you see. Because anything can be changed. Fake news, right? because it can be enhanced. It can. It's not the old day that when I saw that, that's actually what happened to the lion. Now through a computer, I can make do the lion do anything. So that's why we all now find it funny when a, a lion and a penguin like each other, or they're dancing, or they're jumping through hoops. We're like, how did they do that? With a computer. So here's a nice example. This is a Tactile. Tactile is a company that works with Microsoft, and at a golf tournament last year, they rolled this out as an example. Gives you a good example of this is the augmented TC reality golf course in Ponte Vedra, Florida, where the Players' Championship is played. It is one of the world's most iconic and challenging golf courses. Much of the 3D geometry that you're seeing here is provided by Bing Maps. So that doesn't exist. You see that at the moment through a pair of goggles. Using menu controls or by using voice commands. Go to the clubhouse. Voice commands. Using intuitive gestures, I can manipulate the map view. For example, I can easily pan the view using a simple tap and hold gesture. Think real estate I have a markets. Number, a number of other tools and Think commands sales. available to me to manipulate the map. For example, zoom, rotation, but I can also annotate over the geometry. Now let's take a look at how we can overlay some useful information over the top of the holographic map. Go to hole 16. So here we'll check out hole 16, which is a long par five. We've integrated the PGA Tours 
ShotLink data that tracks every player's shot for tour events. Let's look at a heat map which shows where all the player's shots landed during round one. Show heat map. Now look at the colors, the red and the blue. So the red areas indicate places where many balls landed, but you'll also notice the shots that landed off into the water, as well as those shots that landed in the trees. So that is simply a, vis a visualization of a current piece of information that already exists. So what if I said, show me Vegas, show me every sale done by every realtor in the last six months, show me every sale by every realtor from the Realty One group, show me only the realtors that have done more than 10 transactions, show me the realtors that only have a five out of five digital media footprint, show me anybody at the same time who's done more than 10 postings on Facebook, show me anybody who's had a license for longer than 20 years. I can start, I'm, I'm going to get to a stage very soon where all the databases, whether it's Zillow or Tulio, or the city council or your MLS or your local or your association or your company or even your competitor company, the data is going to start being integrated or available, whether it's IDX or shared or obtained or licensed or controlled. At some stage, CoreLogic and Black Knight's going to talk to each other. Right? It's just a question of getting all the stuff together. Most of the data sources we have at the moment were created by different entrepreneurs on different platforms at different times. So they don't have the same protocols. We're trying to overcome that as quickly as possible. Now there's a lot of politics in between. You put upstream in between, you put RPR in between, and NAR and Zillow, and you have a battle. It's okay, it will end. Right? Somebody will win. Doesn't matter who's gonna win. You'll get better data, you'll get better services. You are gonna get access to more information. As you get access to more information, the consumer will get access to that information. They will start using it better than they are using it now. You need to make sure that you are ahead of that curve, that you have a great digital footprint, that you can be found and that your data is integratable because it's pretty nice. Now you could say, well, not everybody's going to wear that big headset thing. No, probably, probably not. But we'll find you a solution around that momentarily. So what happens is augmented reality is reality, virtual stuff put together. Now, the next step past this, this is a little light. You see there's a little green light there. There's the little light, right? So this is just a simple laser light which people use as a kind of a pointer. So the light goes to whichever place where the light will end up to. Why does it end up on my hand? I don't know. Doesn't it just end up on the next flat surface? What if I told the light, I don't want you to go to the next flat surface. I want you to go 12 feet, 6 inches, and 2, 3, 1 third of a half an inch and just stop in midair. Well, we've never told light to do that because we didn't know we could tell light to do that. They've now figured out that they can tell light to do one anything they want. So you no longer have to send light from one source to the next flat surface, TV, drive-in, theater, wall. You can send light any distance and you can tell it to stop in midair. Interesting. So now I can send one piece of light to here and another piece of light a little bit further, which means I can create a hologram in midair for you. It's not there, you can put your hand through it, it doesn't exist. But it's the same visual image that you would throw against the screen, it's just not against the screen, it's in nowhere land. I can walk around it. So here are some examples. This is the world with holograms. This is Microsoft's example. In a house. What will they enable us to do? Everything. What New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. Voice control. Cyberspace. More immersive ways to play. Virtual reality. Holograms. New Video ways games. to teach and learn. Maybe so I can put teach the new you better. in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. Maybe I can get Trump to fund it. New ways to collaborate and explore the places we've never been. Collaborate, MLSs, good idea. Look at this formation. Let's take a closer look. Elon Musk telling real estate on Mars. And new ways to create the things we imagine. He's building something for his kid. He doesn't touch anything. Watch him. Because when you change the way you see the world, you change the way you see the you world. You can change the world you see. You can change the world you see.
This is Microsoft HoloLens. So not a Microsoft commercial because they don't know I'm putting it up here. I just wanted to show you from the kinds of, so the kinds of companies which are probably gonna do all this stuff. Okay, enough. It's probably gonna be the Microsofts. Go back one, stop, 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 stop. So the ones which are probably gonna dominate the space in the future, probably the Microsofts, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, right? The ones which have now set themselves up to be in the new paradigm. They've now already been in business 10, 15 years. They've got critical mass on something. They're not all making money. Some of them are, but they're not all making money as much as they should be. But they all have most users or most eyeballs or most transactions or most clients or biggest online this or biggest online that. So there are probably dozens, but there's probably five companies that are so large that they are making in the tens of billions profits. If you make in the tens of billions of profits, you do not know what to do with your money. You have too much money. You can't just keep on doing search engine optimization. It's boring. So what happens is these companies are increasingly investing in other industries. That's why you find some of these companies are saying, well, we're going to do space technology. Google, we're going to do self-driving cars. How is a search engine and self-driving cars you know, tied to each other? How, how is Facebook tied to going to Mars? They have additional money, they have additional capital, so they are exploring other industries. Increasingly, people are looking at our industry and going like, what? Realtors do what? Right? No licensing requirements. If they do, it's only 40 hours. It's easy. You can get a license almost with your eyes closed. The CE requirements, you can have your assistant take it, no big deal. You don't even have to sell a house. Your broker doesn't even do anything about it if you don't. You can just hang out and hang your license somewhere. They work part-time. They only actually work Sundays between two to five. It's a part-time week. And then they get this 6% on a million dollars and make this big commission, like $60,000 for sale over a weekend. It's actually, so it's $20,000 an hour. It's incredible. They have no responsibility. If they screw anything up, they've got insurance, Arizona insurance. They're so fragmented. They never work together. They can't agree on anything. You should just see the MLSs and the association. They keep on fighting about everything. There's no real national company. They're all franchises because they're all fragmented. And can you ever get two realtors to do the same thing? Never. They fight against each other. They don't trust each other. All right. Slight exaggeration, right? <laughs> Maybe not. No. So but I, I quickly covered it in because this is my space which I live in. I love you dearly. It's hard when you sit in a room with outsiders and that's how they describe us. You know, you want to take the guy and <laughs> there's a little bit of truth to some of that, right? So they look at our space. Last year, you guys, not this company, but you guys, meaning us, realtors, right? Real estate agents earned 60 billion in commissions. Whichever way you look at that number, that is a big, big number. Whether you're Microsoft or Amazon or Facebook, it doesn't matter, 60 billion. So when you're trying to expand into other industries because you've got surplus cash, cash and somebody says, here's an unsophisticated, unautomated business, which is fragmented, and they earn 60 billion a year in commissions. Great, this looks like an easy target. Now, some companies have already tried We've, we've seen Microsoft try before. Remember Home Advisor? <laughs> we had Bank of America try. We've had many outsiders try. And to date, almost all outsiders have failed. There are one or two successes. You would consider HFS, which was a hospitality company, which then became Center, which today became Realogy, which now owns about a third of the market. You would not consider that a failure. You would consider that a success. But we have had more failures than we've had successes. But most of those attempts were 20 years ago. 20 years ago. We did not have all of this technology available 20 years ago. So today, with this new technology, we believe actually it's going to become actually easier for them to do so. Everybody wants data consolidated, companies consolidated, companies are becoming bigger. We're integrated with mortgage companies and title companies. As that consolidation happens, the battle is just simply going to heat up. You're in a great position to fight it if you're part of a strong team. You try and go this solo, it's going to be a tough fight. Tough fight. You're better off together than being alone. So that previous one from Microsoft had these big Google glasses on it. You're going to say, well, nobody's going to wear that. So Germany just found a way to do exactly that with no glasses. Here's real view. RealView has developed what is probably the most advanced 3D interactive visualization system. 
Our holographic system allows physicians to work with the patient's true 3D anatomy, appearing as precise volumetric holograms floating in midair. There is no eyewear, no 2D screen. We are presenting the real thing. Presenting the th real thing so I can look at Cooper's dad's heart without taking his clothes off, without making any incisions, by just putting him in front of a camera, take a shot of his heart, bring it basically out here, put it in 3D while it's pumping. Not just the image, it's actually pumping. You can see it pumping. You can actually walk around and you can actually touch it. So I can say, right, see here, this art of yours is very good condition. Your heart is very strong here and here and this. I can discuss it with the client. If I can do that to a heart, can't I do that to a home? What are we struggling here with? We say, somebody's going to steal something in the house. <laughs> so we've got to get over some of our traditional hurdles because other industries have already gone way past. We're not the leaders, which is OK. We don't have to be a leader as an industry. We can be a follower. Let, let the hospitality or the medical guys go figure it out because we don't want to spend the money. I'm trying to tell you the technology in many cases is already there. So to get to the level which I think we are going to get to relatively soon, because we have the first elements of that, is some kind of computer learning. It is widely more known today as machine learning, machine referring to the computer. It means when a machine starts teaching itself. So all of us should have a mentor. You should all have a coach. A coach, a mentor, somebody smarter than you, somebody who's done it before you, somebody who's walked the path before you, somebody who's a good teacher, who's willing to teach you, to tell you, to share with you some good ideas of how you can be better. A machine now does that on its own. It looks at what you did, and you did, and you did, and you did, and you did. If I ask you any question like Jeopardy, I don't know, I'm just guessing now, you'll probably only get 20% of the answers right. If I ask you, you probably only get 20%. I might only get 19%. But you're not going to get 100% because they're hard questions. But you might get ones right which I don't get right. You might get some which she didn't get right. So as an individual, I might be right 20% of the time. If I'm smart, 30, 40, 50. The machine remembers all your answers and yours 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 and yours. And yours. So within a period of time, that machine has learned everything there is basically to learn. And because it can access its database, it can do so in a split second. So when you're still thinking and you have an 80% chance or 70% chance to be wrong, it gets the right answer instantaneously. It becomes scary when the machine learns from itself, simply not because it's smarter than you. It just remembers everything you've done and everything everybody else has done. Now, it can absolutely make a mistake, absolutely but it does so with less frequency than the average human does. That's the concept of machine learning. So we have many examples of machine learning. It's already everywhere. To some cases, when you do a Facebook search and they call up ads which are applicable, they find you, they finish your sentence. You're doing a Google search and it finishes your sentence for you. That's the beginning of an algorithm which is some kind of smart technology which says, oh, you typed this before, or the way you're typing it, it looks like it's going to end up be this way. It starts giving you options and starts filling your sentence. That's the beginning of machine learning. Google's cars driving around on their own without a human. That's machine learning. First, you had to tell a computer, this is a human, this is a table, this is a road, this is a lamp, that is a red light. First day, he didn't know that. You tell him at once, he remembers that. You show it to him a thousand times, he, he's got it, I got it. So here is an example. So let's just take self-driving cars. Every single major manufacturer of cars everywhere in the world has announced that they will have self-driving cars before 2020. Some have already brought it up now, but it's a very basic, or park itself in a car. But complete self-driving cars, every single manufacturer says that they will have something available. Here are some tests which have already been run recently. Last year, a BMW drove itself down the Autobahn, Audi sent an autonomous vehicle up Pikes Peak, and at the Tokyo Auto Show in November, Toyota unveiled its Prius Avos, which is an acronym for Automatic Vehicle Operation System, which can be summoned by the rider. So they've now gone up mountains with dirt roads. They've gone on the Autobahn. No accident, one side, other side. So let's assume that we have cars available tomorrow, just like we could have Amazon.com available or ATMs 20 years ago. The problem isn't the car technology. The problem is, can you handle that? If your son goes to school in an autonomous car, which he doesn't drive because you can't take him so the car drives in, and the car's in an accident, let's say the car wasn't to blame. Let's say some elderly person drove into the car accidentally. Who's to blame? 
the kid who doesn't have a license, the parent who put the kid in the car who shouldn't have, but did, but who thought it was okay, the city council that issued a license that shouldn't have, the car that actually drove, the other driver of the car, other circumstances maybe like weather, something exceptional, maybe malfunction in the software. So if we, we are still struggling with the responsibilities of what will happen if cars are now suddenly driven by all non-people. You're going far, you fall asleep in the back seat, the car drives itself through to the other side of the country. Elderly people can't go to shops anymore because they can't drive, they haven't got a driver's license, the car takes them. It will solve endless problems, but it has a lot of problems itself. Right, so why do I need a realtor to go show me an open house again? Explain that to me. <laughs> if I can have a car, just drive them around. If I can control the front door locks with my smart house device, if I have a drone flying past them the whole time and giving them a message of the house in my voice, past the, with them as they're walking through the house, do I need you physically there? Now, it still feels strange. I'm not, not recommending it, it does, but it's just possible. But what is a, I don't know, artificial, smart kind of, not just a, not just a car, could something, else, could something else be smart? So here, Harvard University was given a task. They said that bees are dying worldwide. Two main reasons, three main reasons. Humans, too many humans, expansion. Secondly, pesticides, we're killing them off. Thirdly, African bees, which are stronger bees than other country bees, are killing off other local bees. So increasingly, we have a smaller population of bees in the world, which means we can't pollinate what we have to pollinate. Pollinate is important for crops. So they went to Harvard University and said, solution. This is Harvard's solution. Rolled out two years ago. Robo bees. Five years ago, these fields were a barren wasteland. Honeybee colonies were collapsing, and pollination had all but stopped. But all of this has changed now, because bees are back. Watch carefully. But wait, what is this? You might think these are ordinary bees, but let us take a closer look. Think robots. These little marvels of advanced robotics are second generation new bees. Nanotechnology. Far superior to the nature counterparts, they have been successfully implemented all over the world. Completely solar powered, a newbie requires very little downtime to recharge. Using real-time triangulation technology, each newbie knows which part of the field has been pollinated, maximizing efficiency and yield. Watch how they take out the enemy! Bees, newbies are fully equipped to fight their natural enemies. As soon as a predator approaches, the newbies are alerted, release a fast-acting insecticide, and neutralize the threat in a second. You could take another realtor up Nothing like can harm them. Interesting. Hm. New bees do not tire, require minimum maintenance, and are produced for a fraction of the upkeep cost of normal bees. They are easily recycled, replaced, and activated. New bees blend in perfectly with nature and are programmed not to harm us. Yeah, right. Soon you'll be able to purchase a whole new colony and activate it in your fields. New bees. They won't harm humans, right? Remember 2001 A Space Odyssey? How? Yeah, right. When I tried to unplug it, it didn't want to unplug. All right, again, just a story, but it is strange. These are already available. You can already buy them in swarms of 10,000. They are already have been sold to many people. We can't buy them commercially. You need a license for them. Guess who's been the number one buyer so far? The military. Oh, well, now I think about it, that makes sense. I didn't think about it before the time. Great spies. You could go release them, think what they could go do for you. So self-powered, self-generated, don't duplicate work, know what the others have done, do what they're told. I mean, none of that is what a realtor does. <laughs> it's all different. Now, I don't think that bees are going to become realtors. Of course, they're not even comparable. But it is fascinating because this becomes somewhat scary. I mean, didn't some of you have a tinkling that you're saying, you're now screwing with God. D don't do this. All right. This becomes, because it suddenly feels like we're taking one step too far. Right? It, it's, a, it's sort of crossing that line. Where is that line? I don't know. We all put it at a different place in our lives. But this is the one where usually people say, I'm not sure. So this all leads at the end to, to trend number one, which basically is, we've got the, the top ten there. We, we already covered them. So we've got about four minutes left, five minutes left. So let's go to number one. Oh, this slide I just put in, because I see some of you are taking videos of this, which you're, of course you're welcome to do. But if you, uh, if you contact one of my staff members, Wendy, 
send her, she will send you one of two things. If you want either one of the two things for free, she will send you a link with all of these videos which you can go download because they're all on YouTube. These aren't secret videos. We've put every single one of them on YouTube. You can go download all of them and show them to your staff. I think, as a matter of fact, I think I showed you 12 today. I think there's 40 online which we have put, others which we've used at other times. Or she will also send you a guide for performing high-performing agents and teams. So just send her an email and just tell her you want the videos and stuff and that you were at the Real T1 conference and she will do that for you. So let's get to number one. It seems that all of these things that we've been looking at today is somehow sort of merging, converging into some form of artificial intelligence, something where people think that they are going to create things that are not necessarily smarter than humans, although many people are saying that, but they are at least referring to the fact that these machines, these devices will be smart devices. They, they will do something intelligent by the fact that they can determine their own intelligence. They are self-learning and they can actually take a, a, a sort of an assumption. So I thought I would give you two examples. Two more videos as we wrap up. The first video is not real. It's only a prototype, it's not available, but this is one person's vision of what they think a future artificial human cyberborg like could look like. Again, it gets to that little scary part. The closer that a, a robot looks like a human, the more uncomfortable humans feel. The more it does not look like a human, the more we go like, oh yeah, that's cute, <laughs> that's nice. So when you look at Asimov, it's pretty nice. When you look at a cyborg, you go like, no. I'm gonna show you a cyborg one, which is not available at the moment, but I wanna show you where some people think it could go, and then I'm gonna show you one which is real, which was rolled out last year, is available as a demo in San Francisco at the moment. And you'll see how they both roll together. So here's the first one, which is sort of a cyborg-like one, human-like cyborg one. All right, so first, sexy, that's pretty nice. Okay, now, no, it's not sex anymore. <laughs> Completely changed my opinion about her. So in this case, they're still showing the female one. They'll show the male one in a second. So versatile, looks human-like, realistic. Looks like a Will Smith I Am Robot movie, right? that they could have these become your house servants. You could take a kid to school. You have a self-driving car, why would you need a robot? Make your dinner? Well, you could just wave things with your hand, why would you do that? Clean your fridge? We've got a smart fridge, you don't need a robot. So maybe the last job available is that of a realtor. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. So that's one vision, not a person who wants to sell realtors. I added the realtor part just for tongue in cheek, right? So I don't think this is coming. I don't think it's scary, but it, it looks very human-like and we feel a little edgy. The next the one. world's first artificial intelligence personal robot. She's real. She's your welcome friend at any hour. She wakes you up in the morning. Nice to I told good morning. It seems like you had a good night's sleep. Eight Smart full day. hours and a good resting heart rate. Ooh, WebMD. Thank you. Your meeting with Jane is at 9.30. Out I put the coffee on. Ooh, kitchen She can stuff. interface kitchen. with household devices. And she's also a personal stylist. What do you think? Why don't you try the blue tie with it? Nice. Good idea. She's your world-class office assistant. That's using artificial notes. intelligence algorithms to analyze data quickly and efficiently. We plan to run a marketing campaign on the Upper East Side of New York. What do you think about that neighborhood? This neighborhood has a very promising outlook for this campaign, with 25,000 housing units. Sounds like a Also, 82% of people living there have a college degree. I think that's the right one for us. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Thomas has a lunch date with Chloe in 15 minutes. She just posted a bunch of photos on Facebook She's about her trip to New York. She's reading your Facebook messages while you're in a meeting. Thank you. Watch the interaction between the two women. Men. Ha. I just sent the meeting notes to you and Thomas. As well as your support when you're at your most creative. Hey, I ordered those paints that you asked for. Also, for lunch, I ordered you some falafel from your favorite restaurant. You're the best. The video goes on, I've stopped it here because we have time restrictions. I think the video goes on for three or four minutes, but you get the picture. So this last person, this last video, is an integration of all the technologies which we saw this morning. And the other technologies which I showed you, with the exception of the cyborg humans, 
are all real. They already exist today. I've seen every single one of them. They're all already here. They're not commercially available. They're prototypes. They've been tested. They've, in most cases, they've all been funded. She has also been created, and she's been rolled out simply as an amalgamation of what could happen. Now, she's still very basic. She can only move around on rollers. She can follow you. But I mean, it's the beginning of. We have one hotel already in Los Angeles that has actually appointed a hotel butler, which is her, a robot like her, which they can actually do home deliveries and she can do deliveries to your room. So you call downstairs, I need toothpaste, I need pizza. She actually dials into the hotel system, controls the elevator, gets to your door, calls you on your house phone, rings you, you open your door, she opens her hood, she gives you the pizza. She says, write me, she turns around, she goes down, does the next delivery. Already rolled out last year, December. You can go to, you can go to the hotel now and go test it out. I did, it's super cool. Now, at the moment, it's still a gimmick. I get that. All I wanted to do this morning is forget your old paradigm. You're with a dynamic company. We are at a dynamic time in our industry's life. The people that built the big businesses in this industry, the Wycots, the Long and Fosters, the Kellers, the Remaxes, the Century 21, those are all great companies. Never badmouth them. Never badmouth them. But they were created 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Many of them can and will survive if they change. Many of them are struggling to do that. It is hard to change customs that you've been stuck into for many, many years. The companies that have the best chance of leading the next 20, 30, 40 years are going to be most likely the younger companies that are progressive, have good leadership, have an open mind, work together, have good technology. You potentially fall in that category. Now, you could screw it up. Don't disappoint me. Don't you dare do that, because I will write about it, right? <laughs> 35 bucks. I'll be watching you. I expect you guys to be one of the most exciting companies in the future. I will be back. Thank you very much.